And it's also in the fall. Well, I only teach it in the spring, spring. but I teach you two sections. Okay, I got you. should be pretty easy to get it. Yeah, if you take the second section, you always end up leaving two minutes earlier. I don't know why. Do it really fast? Just the way it works out. When I teach two in a row, the second section, I must skip something. Oh, it's always two minutes. Okay, I'll take the second section maybe. It's good to know. Just a boy in our car. At first, he was scared, but <laughs> I feel like she explained it. Was... Right. So today we're talking about the mainline denominations and progressive Christianity. This is the form of Christianity that I grew up in. Just to give you an idea, my my pastor, when I was a kid, had uh, had this class, and we studied the resurrection of Jesus. We read this book that's actually written by an LCMS guy, and in this book, they discover the body of Jesus. It's a fictional book. They discover the body of Jesus, a skeleton in God's closet. But at the end, sorry, spoiler, if you want to read the book, they find out, not shockingly, it was all fake. Of course, they didn't discover the body of Jesus. And my pastor was really, really disappointed in that end because he wants to have a Christianity where it doesn't matter whether Jesus rose from the dead because that's not important. That is progressive Christianity where whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, whether or not any doctrine is really matters, just isn't important. Whether he performed miracles doesn't matter. So that's what we'll look at today. But to highlight this, I'm sure you all know, but it's really important to know, we are not talking about the way someone votes in an election. We aren't talking about being a liberal and wanting higher taxes or anything like that. We are talking about theological liberals. Conservative, evangelical, Lutheran, confessional Lutherans, we can all have some really good disagreements and still get along in matters of faith if we don't agree on what the government does. So that's not what we're talking about. Here we are talking about a movement. It's been around for over 100 years now with a lower view of the Bible. So in other words, it is not the prime source of authority that seeks to reinterpret the Bible and important doctrines like did Jesus really rise from the dead and does that matter? Okay. And that believe that Christianity is about works. Christianity is about loving your neighbor primarily. So that's what we're going to look at. When I think about the main focus, I've done this for every denomination. I would say for them, the main focus is that God's not done yet. In fact, if you've ever driven by uh, the church on 8th Street, they always have creative signs up. It's a... It's a UCC, yeah, 8th Street South. The motto of their denomination, God is still speaking. And what they mean by that is that God, we are still progressing in our knowledge of God and we're still learning from God, right? And that might sound good, but the problem for them is that that means whatever we used to believe doesn't particularly matter. What matters is what we believe now and what God is telling us to do now, okay? So, that you will find that sin is not particularly spoken about. So the purpose of Christianity isn't really about salvation for you and I. It's more about salvation for the world. How can we make the world a better place? And we can do that with, the, with them by standing up for the poor and the oppressed. So they aren't going to talk about your individual sin, but they will talk about the sins of the community, the sin of how we've treated people across time. And how we can make up for that today. So it's not really about the new heavens and the new earth. It's about making this earth a better place. So that's their focus. Now, just so you don't think I'm um, 
going too far. I'll just tell you what they believe. So this is from progressivechristianity.org. Their five beliefs. So one, the spirit moves across many faith traditions. In other words, they don't believe you need to be a Christian to be saved. You don't have to have faith in Jesus to be saved. The spirit works through Islam, Buddhism, atheism. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> then we need to be inclusive to everyone, right? Regardless of, you know, age, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, all that. And we should strive for peace and justice. And another one that we're going to focus in on, that they really trust science, contemporary science. So oftentimes they will place that above the scriptures. And that there's more value in questioning than in absolutes. So it's better to question traditional doctrine than to come to an opinion about it, than to say, this is what the Bible teaches. It's better to keep an open mind and keep questioning. So another way, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this was just another website I found, <laughs> Progressive Christians. And here's kind of the key takeaway that I want you to get from this page. We believe in a God that isn't landlocked to a 6,000-year-old collection of, of writings, a.k.a. the Bible, unable to speak in real time to those who see. Revelation can come within and independent of the Bible. So it's not going to be all about um, um, sola scriptura, you might say. So our task as Christians is to get rid of thousands of years of racism and misogyny and all those things that have hurt people on earth so that we can make the earth better. And a key one, if you ask a Lutheran what's the heart of the gospel, it's going to be the forgiveness of sins. But here it's social justice. So it's about making the world better by checking power, by healing people that are hurt, including people that maybe feel left out by the church. So their feelings are going to matter more. Now, that's their definition, but we won't leave it there. What do its critics say that it is? So I'm going to give you the fancy terminology, and then I'm going to interpret it, because this one's a bit much. The current Western spiritual zeitgeist wrapped in moralistic, therapeutic, panentheism, and on and on. So let me just give you the shorthand version. Okay? <laughs> it's a movement from our culture. Think about what our culture values. Inclusivity, the feelings of happiness. Right? If you ask a parent, what do you want for your kid? Most of the time, the parent is going to say, I just want them to be happy. That is modern culture. So if your kid's not happy because of something the Bible says, like it's wrong to live with someone before you get married. You value your child's happiness more than what the word says. Okay? So that's one. The next one is that the main thing God cares about is you being happy on earth and your well-being on earth. So that's that moralistic therapeutic part. And then God is not just God. God is not only present throughout the entire world. God is the entire world. You have God in you, not just as a temple of the Holy Spirit, but you have a divine spark in you. You are, to some extent, God. There was recently a sermon that came out by a progressive Christian who said that God worships you because you're God. Now, does every progressive Christian think that? Absolutely not, thankfully. So that's that panentheism part. God is not separate from his creation. He is his creation. Okay. Then we've got one that rejects that the Bible is inerrant and infallible and the primary source of authority. So they reject that and they claim to be Christian. And here's one that a lot of Lutherans struggle with. They believe they are better Christians than you. They believe that their, their version of Christianity is the real thing not the conservative view. Okay. So that's what the critics would say. And we're going to kind of look at its history because it didn't come out of nowhere and it didn't just pop out, pop up 10 years ago. So we could actually say it has its roots way back with Augustine many, 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 many years ago when he was talking to a heretic, Maniki, Manichius, uh, named Faustus. Okay. Here's what Augustine said to him. 
you ought to plainly say that you don't believe the gospel of Christ. For to believe what you please and to not believe what you please, in other words, to pick and choose what parts of the Bible you want to believe in, is to believe yourself and not the gospel. So you can't just pick what you want. What the Manichians were doing were basically following the philosophy of the age. And they said, you know what, this philosophy, it's probably true, so let's make Christianity fit with the modern philosophy. And I see that that's really what progressive Christianity is doing today. Taking the values of our culture and trying to make it fit with the Bible. Well, making the Bible say what they want. Anyone know who that is? She's an ELCA, yeah. She's an ELCA pastor called Nadia Bowles Weber. Um, there is a Lutheran, a confessional Lutheran, who um, has spoken against her quite a bit. He calls her a pastrix because she's <laughs> a female, and so she's really claimed that label. So we're going to talk some more about her, but she's an ELCA pastor following the modern times. So we could say that it goes way back to any time in history when we've placed cultural values ahead of the Bible. But to get progressive Christianity in its modern sense, we actually have to go back to the 1800s. So we had this thing. It was the historical critical method. Think about the 1800s. All of this science was being discovered. People were questioning everything that they had believed. And there was a lot of value placed on science and experts. So what they wanted to do was find a way to have science and Christianity work together. And what they often ended up saying was that we would read the Bible for faith, but then we would read, uh, we could use um, science to figure out what parts of the Bible were really true or really false. It arose in Germany. Sorry, it arose out of the Lutherans. They weren't particularly Lutheran by that time, but they were in name Lutheran. So higher critical method means that we look at the Bible and we study it like anything else. We look for what's true and we look for what's false. Okay. Now, a big key takeaway I want you to get from this is that back in this time, they still believed that there was an actual truth. There was something that was true and something that was false and we could figure it out. Okay. So we could actually look at the Bible and figure out for sure whether Jesus rose from the dead or not by studying things. And it was actually something that we would want to know. We would still want to know truth. So historical critical method has impacted every mainline denomination. It is taught in every single seminary. So if you think about Methodists, the ELCA, all of those, they use some version of the historical critical method. Now, it even came into the LCMS, if you've ever heard of Seminex. We sort of, this was our fight. We had to figure out whether we were going to follow the mainline path or whether we were going to reject it and stick with the Bible as our sole source of authority. So a little bit more, if you just kind of want to understand the concept, with, if you follow this method, you don't believe that we can trust that the Bible is without error. So if we want to study what the Bible really teaches, we need to understand the culture of the people that wrote it. And that part's not necessarily bad, right? To learn more about the culture that it was written in is good. Problem is, they just took it too far. So if they couldn't find evidence of something in the Bible, that means it didn't happen. So a lot of time, or back in the 1800s, when they were looking at this, um, they said stuff like the Gospel of John had to be written in about 200 AD or later. It couldn't have been written by John. They had different reasons for saying that, but here's what's interesting. We now have actual writings from the book of John from the very first century. We know that it wasn't written in 200. They trusted their science even when the science ended up being wrong. Okay. So if we think about this, many of them now bring a bias to the text. They say that you cannot ever find anything supernatural. Supernatural is impossible. So you cannot have a virgin birth, so Mary must not have been a virgin. You cannot have someone rise from the dead. So Jesus could not have physically rose, risen from the dead. Here's a creative one. Um, um, we were at the Sea of Galilee, and my pastor that I told you about didn't believe that Jesus walked on water. He said that what Jesus did was walk on stones that were under the water. 
So it looked like he was walking on the water. Then I heard a sermon from a Methodist pastor who actually wanted to be a progressive but couldn't. So he was talking about the feeding of the 5,000. He didn't want it to be a miracle. What he wanted it to be was that people were so caring of each other that they just shared those 12 loaves between them. But this was interesting because he was fighting with himself. He still ultimately believed God's word and said it must have been a miracle, even though he didn't like it. So good for him, but kind of weird. So I've been teaching Sunday school for middle schoolers. And if you listen to the historical critical people, a lot of Isaiah wasn't written when it says it was written. Here's why. There are such specific prophecies in it. It says that eventually they are going to be released from captivity by King Cyrus. It actually uses the word Cyrus. That's his name. It's named in there. So what did the historical critical people say? They say that must have been written later and then put back in because you cannot have a miracle. It's impossible. Now, Jesus seminar was something that came about in the 90s, I think it was, 80s or 90s. They would actually vote on what they thought was true in the Bible and what wasn't. So, short story, Sermon on the Mount, that was true. Every single miracle, that was false. Everything they didn't like was false. So when Jesus compares the woman to a dog, that didn't happen because they don't like it. So they threw it out. Now, not every person that follows this kind of thinking is going to throw everything out. Many of them might like elements of this, but still try to some extent to follow the Bible. So this came about, we ended up not just in the LCMS, but cr across America, there were fights, not literal fights, but people started uh, figuring out whether or not we should follow this new method or stick with the old. So Harry Emerson Fosdick, he wrote a sermon in 1922, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And he said, we should follow the, the historical critical method and we should look for an open-minded Christianity that does, isn't about doctrine, that we should find what unites us and work together to make the world better. What did he say? They call me a heretic. He said, well, I am a heretic if conventional orthodoxy is the standard. Now, here's a really interesting thing. We sing a hymn of his, God of grace and God of glory. It's in our hymnal. Now, in this hymn, it sounds very orthodox, and that's going to give us something that we can talk about in a bit. A lot of times they will use orthodox terminology. They'll just redefine words. So it sounds right, and we can sing it in good conscience because we know the orthodox parts of it. But it does come from... So great Jake Gresham Machem, he was a reformed theologian, and he basically took up the other side. He took up the fundamentalist side. In other words, the side that believed that the Bible is inerrant and inspired. And he wrote a wonderful book. You have Audible. It's free on Audible. Christianity and Liberalism, 1923. Right. Here's what he said. Christ died. That is history. That's true. Objectively true. It happened. Christ died for our sins. That is doctrine. And you need to have both. If Christ didn't actually die, then he didn't die for our sins. History and doctrine work together. If you try to remove from Christianity everything that the scientists reject about it, uh, i.e. all the miracles, the apologist has abandoned all of Christianity. You give up the main stuff, you give up Christianity. So then he said, the question is not whether Mr. Fosdick is winning men, but whether the thing to which he is winning them is Christianity. So to kind of back up, talk about what these mainline denominations are, we have got what are called the Seven Sisters. And I got curious, where did the name mainline come from? It came from this railroad track that went through downtown Philadelphia. It was the main line. And every single one of those churches was on the main line. These were the churches that were found throughout the United States. In order of kind of size of their church, United Methodist, ELCA, on and on down the line, how you get to uni uh, United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ. 
what unites these churches isn't what their doctrine says. It's not what they officially have in their old confessions. Because most of them don't believe you have to hold to them. What unites them more is that they have a similar way of reading the Bible. And that they, they believe that unity is more important than doctrine. So here is an interesting one. If you wanted to be a Presbyterian Church USA clergy, they said you'd be more likely to be rejected for being narrow-minded, for actually believing your confessions. That's what will stop you from being a pastor, not for violating what your confessions actually say. So Presbyterians follow the Westminster uh, Confession, but if you actually believe it, you will not become a Presbyterian pastor in it. So, um, interesting thing, these used to make up 30% of the U.S. population, now it's 15%. But, this was random trivia, you don't need to know, but FYI, South Dakota still has the highest percentage at 32%. Yes? Is that, is that something reflective of a percentage of Christianity in general? Um, this is of the total population right. in the state, okay. or country, not just Christians. Okay. So another word for mainline is simply ecumenical Protestants. So to give you an idea of this, the ELCA has full fellowship with United Methodists. So even though United Methodism came out of Wesleyism, which we've covered before, and even though the Presbyterian Church comes out of the Reformed, the ELCA shares pastors, pulpits, altars, and all of that with these churches. Basically, with everyone except the American Baptists. They're kind of off on their own. They're, they're not quite as progressive as the others. I looked at a study. I was trying to find a study of what ELCA pastors believe. I couldn't find a great one. Couldn't find one about doctrine. But I did find that 93% support same-sex marriage and 85% support abortion among the ELCA pastors. So progressive Christianity was basically the main lines, but then something happened. The mainline churches looked like they're all dying. And if you look at their populations, they are just going down. There's fewer of them. So it seemed like maybe this is a problem that's just going to go away. And then it arose in the evangelical church. too, And that's where it's really taking off. So now it's both the main lines and a lot of churches that used to be evangelicals. Right. So um, we can also find um, theological progressivism in Catholics and even in Orthodox. So you can find it everywhere. What the evangelical church had in the early 2000s was something called the emergent church. I'm not going to get into, but people thought it went away. But the emergent church leader said, no, it didn't go away. We just call ourselves progressives now. So it's the same thing. And what you get with progressivism <laughs> is this, a lower view of the Bible from that historical critical method that we talked about, plus postmodernism, aka there is no objective truth. And we'll talk about that one in just a sec. Plus enthusiasm, finding God outside of his word. If you combine all three of those together, you are going to get progressive Christianity. So postmodernism is something that most people believe, even though they don't know the fancy word. So it came out of like this way of reading literature, but it didn't stay there. A lot of times philosophies come up in, in colleges, and we're used to kind of ignoring those crazy professors and what they say. But it filters down into society just without the fancy words. So progress, uh, postmodernism, one way to say it is this. There is no right way to interpret something. There's only what you think about. It. So, in other words, if you read something, what matters isn't what the author intended to write. What matters is how you feel about it, how you think about it, how you interpret it. That's kind of the main way of reading literature nowadays. So one thing we can do with that is that we can reinterpret anything. Jesus rose from the dead is the fundamental part of Christianity. But you could say maybe he rose from the dead in the minds of his, of his followers. Maybe he spiritually rose from the dead, not physically. 
you just redefine it. And who's to say that your interpretation is wrong? In fact, about the only interpretation they will say is wrong is one that says that your view is the right one. So if you say that Jesus died rising from the dead means he physically rose from the dead, and if you're wrong, and if you disagree with that, that's the wrong interpretation. So here's the question. Here's where it pops up. Um, we went to, I've been to a few of these now, to the, uh, read. what is the, the apologetics conference we go to stand for? Reality apologetics. Reality apologetics. Reality yeah. apologetics. Yeah. <laughs> She, one of the speakers there, teaches postmodernism by talking about ice cream. Uh, here's what I say. Vanilla ice cream is the best ice cream. Vanilla ice cream is the best one. How many of you agree with me? How many of you think vanilla ice cream is the best? Okay. Is that an objective or a subjective truth claim? Subjective. subjective. All right. Christianity is true. Is that objective or subjective? Objective. objective. But if you had gone to this thing, you would have found that all these evangelical kids and some LCMS ones, almost all of them said it was subjective. That it was dependent upon you, not dependent upon an objective truth claim. Jesus rose from the dead is an objective claim. Maybe true or maybe false. Obviously, we, we say that it's true. But there is a truth there. Postmodernism says, we don't know. There is no truth. Religion is like ice cream. Pick your favorite. And that's what matters. Okay. If it's true for you, great. And true for you means it helps you lead a happier, more fulfilling life. And if it does, you should go along with it. And if it doesn't, you should get rid of it. So if confessional Lutheranism is dragging you down because it's not allowing you to live with a girlfriend, or not allowing you to um, be LGBT, something like that, then it's wrong because it makes your life hard. So get rid of it. So five signs here of progressive Christianity. We kind of covered a bunch of them, so we'll just kind of summarize it here. A lowered view of the Bible. Got the authority of feelings that we can reinterpret because of postmodernism, essential doctrines. We can redefine historic terms as well. Right? What, does, what is sin? Well, maybe we just redefine sin. Here, the heart of the gospel message is, is gone from sin and redemption to social justice. So here's one example of that. God didn't require a sacrifice for our sins. That's what progressivism says. Instead, what early Christians did was they picked up the sacrificial idea from pagans and brought it into Christianity. So it doesn't really matter. So we don't actually have to preach the gospel as Lutherans would define it. We just need to show love because the sacrifice part didn't really matter. So the lowered view of the Bible here, they would say that the Bible isn't the story of God giving us a revelation. It's the story of what people thought about God and how what they thought about God has changed over time. So early people thought God was vengeful. So they came up with sacrifices. And now over time, we've learned a bit more. And now we think that God is more gracious. So you could see glimmers of that in the New Testament. But Paul screwed up. He didn't fully understand God. God. Paul was still a misogynist. He didn't want women pastors or anything like that. So God is progressing now and helping us understand him even more fully. So now God is more inclusive. Some terms you might see from progressive Christians, that the Bible's a human. That they will literally say the Apostle Paul was wrong. And that the Bible contains the word of God. In other words, God's word somewhere in there. It's up to us to figure out which part is true and which is false. And it typically ends up being the stuff that we like is the stuff we say is from God. The authority of feelings is another one. So here's some common quotes. I thought homosexuality was a sin until I met gay people. Or until my kid came out. 
I just can't believe that Jesus would send good people to hell. It makes me feel bad. So God wouldn't be so exclusive. Those are all terms that you'll see. And what we're doing there is we're saying it doesn't matter what the Bible says. What matters is what I feel is true. So that's how you end up with feelings mattering more. So a lot of them will say there's one attribute of God that matters, and that's that he is love. So anything that seems to fit with that idea will be true. And if it doesn't, it's false. In other words, the stuff that don't seem loving must not be God's word. Then we can reinterpret essential gospel, uh, essential doctrine. So here's one quote. Right? The resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to be factual to speak true. And that one does sound crazy, and it kind of should. Because for us, the essence of our faith, right? God, Jesus came to earth, died for our sins, and he actually rose from the dead. How many of you have seen the Life of Pi movie? I watched it with my parents. They loved it, and they're progressive Christian, and I hated it. So I'll kind of give you the, sorry, spoilers again. This guy was in a, a shipwreck. And then throughout the movie, it makes really exciting things happen. Like there was a tiger that survived the shipwreck and all this magical stuff happens and it's beautiful. So he survives this awful, awful shipwreck, but gets these beautiful experiences. And the kind of story of the movie is basically whether to be an atheist or not. And at the end, here's kind of the basic approach that he takes. He was talking to this atheist and the atheist is basically, is that true? Did that actually happen? And he says, it doesn't matter because I could have a shipwreck and just be ugly and boring, right? You have a shipwreck. It's awful. You're lost at sea. There's no beautiful miracles. It's just depressing. Or we could have this beautiful story of a shipwreck where we get tigers and magic. Believe the one that makes you feel better. So believe in Christianity, believe in religion because of how it makes you feel, not whether or not it's true. So believe the one just because you like it. So other ways that they're doing it, redefine sexuality. Nadia Bowles-Weber, that ELCA pastor, she's written a book about this. She says we need to throw out the traditional ethic and come up with a new one. The idea of literal hell is offensive, so we need to reinterpret it. Maybe it's short term. Maybe it doesn't exist. Original sin wasn't the problem. So here's an essential doctrine. The problem was shame. That's what many progressives believe. There was no original sin. The only sin was believing that you were separated from God. That's the sin. So to give you an example of this, In Christ Alone is a, is a contemporary hymn. Um, it's kind of good. Most people, even those that don't like contemporary music, will still like In Christ Alone. But it has this line in it, the wrath of God was satisfied. The Presbyterian Church USA wanted that hymn in their new hymnal. They didn't like that word. The wrath of God was satisfied. They wanted it changed to the love of God was magnified. So um, good news here, the hymn writer refused, so they don't have this hymn in their Bible. In their hymn. We can redefine terms. So if you go to a mainline church, many, if not most, will recite um, the Apostles' Creed. They might even say the Nicene Creed, but they don't mean the same thing. They redefine words. ELCA removed descended into hell from their hymnal. They removed all masculine pronouns from the Psalms. They added a hymn called Mothering God. There's more, I just don't remember the name. We just redefine terms to make it fit. And the big one, and we're going to talk about this one for a while because it's sort of key. If justification is the doctrine by which the church stand, stands or falls, getting that wrong is a big problem. So here, the gospel is not about Jesus dying and rising for our sins. It's about social justice. The most common terminology you're going to hear now from progressive Christians is that Jesus dying on the cross would be 
cosmic child abuse. That's the <laughs> phrase that they use. Jesus was God's child. A loving father would never send his son to die on the cross. That would be abusive. So what's the problem with that? I mean, other than the fact that God did, why would we say it's not cosmic child abuse? Let's start with the simple. Was Jesus a child? One, he was an adult. And two, who was Jesus? God. God. God sacrificed himself. God went willingly to die for our sins. Right? It's not like Jesus... Um, couldn't have not gone to the cross, right? He chose to. So a few quotes from people. In the Sermon on the Mount, there is not a single word about what to believe, only about what to do. And then this progressive Christian says, three centuries later in the Nicene Creed, there's not a single word about what to, what to do. It's all about what to believe. So what matters isn't what we believe. It matters what we do. And I would say this is a pretty selective reading of the Bible. If you read the Bible, Jesus often commands people to believe. Believe. Repent and believe. Belief is there. She just picked the one little part that didn't talk about what to believe. So um, a lot of times they will also be politically progressive. Because if you don't think humans are born sinful, then probably they're causing all sorts of crime just due to the way they were raised. So if we fix that maybe they will stop committing crime. So let's read the story of man according to Lutherans. God created the world and man in six literal days. And man was created in his image. Mankind sinned and was separated from God, and we deserve eternal punishment. But God loved us, so he sent his son to die for us. He born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and rose from the dead. Now, how do we learn about that now? We learn about it through God's written revelation, which was inspired by God. Inerrant, infallible, it cannot be wrong. It is God-breathed. And my absolute favorite theological word, it makes me roll my eyes and I love it, perspicuous, which is a really fancy way of saying it is clear. Why don't they just say clear? In other words, if you read the Bible and I read the Bible, we wouldn't come to the exact same opinions about every source of doctrine. But here's what we would know. Jesus died for our sins. We are sinners that need to be saved. And anyone reading the Bible will come away with that message. <coughs> so compare that to Nadia Bold Weber. This is actually in one of her books. The Bible is not clear about cuss word. Not clear. You can't know. So we don't believe in progressivism unless we talk about the fact that in the Old Testament, they didn't fully understand God. They saw the types and the shadows. And then in the New Testament, God gave us the full image. Now we can fully understand the Old and the New Testament. According to progressives, humans have evolved not only physically, but also spiritually. We've evolved in our understanding of God. And God is working through that evolution. There wasn't a fall. No real fall. So what we really need to do is realize that we've never been separated from God. Remember, God is part of us. God, that divine spark, God is us. So the Bible is man, the story of man trying to understand God. We saw glimpses of it, but now we understand more fully. So the New Testament shows us more but we still see some flaws in the New Testament, like women not being able to be pastors or LGBT people not being accepted. So we are still learning about God. So our theology can change as well. Now the ELCA, they kind of did things differently. Lutheranism is a bit different, so it doesn't surprise me that progressivism went a bit differently in the ELCA. What it started with was gospel reductionism. So here's the basic idea of this one. The only thing that matters is that Jesus died for your sins. Would we say that that's the prime thing? Absolutely. Well, they would say that's the only thing that matters. So it doesn't matter about evolution. It doesn't matter about women pastors. It doesn't matter whether the miracles happened or not. 
All that mattered is that God loves you and sent his son to die for you. So throw out every other source of doctrine. It just doesn't matter. In fact, if you look at Seminex, that was kind of a lot of the defense of the, the people that were in seminary, that were teaching at the seminary. But we still hold to the important thing, the main thing. So it doesn't matter if we have some different opinions about whether the Red Sea was parted or not. So that doesn't matter. But progressivism is about evolution and gospel reductionism has also evolved. So now we've got two different kinds of strands of it. One is more traditional. It is about the main thing, but here's what they say. Once someone knows that they're a sinner, they don't need to hear it again. So we are going to have our sermons be about how to live a godly life. So lots of law. The other one is Nadia Bowles Weber's approach. We are not sinners. We are simply members of an oppressive system that sinned. So the main thing is to overcome oppression. And Jesus helps us overcome that because we can look to him as an example of someone who suffered and was oppressed. Following his example is the main thing. Law is the main thing. So even though he claims to say the gospel is what matters, both end up in law. Now, another big one to talk about when we talk about um, progressivism is what is law? So in traditional Christianity, we've defined love for many centuries. To love someone is to will their good, not necessarily what they want, but to will what's best for them. Right? As a parent, you don't necessarily want to discipline your child, but you love them. You want what's best for them, so you make them suffer temporarily for their good. That's love. But that also means if someone disagrees with us, we would say that we can still love them. We don't have to fully agree with everything they do to still love them and want what's best for them. In fact, if we know that they're doing something bad for them, it's our loving duty to warn them that they're in danger. Okay. Now let's flip it around to progressive Christianity. To love someone is to affirm someone. To show them love is to love them as they wish to experience love. So if they wish to be identified as LGBT, the only loving thing to do is to affirm that. So what other people know what's best for them, so to love them, respect what they want. And it goes beyond that. They would say that we cannot love someone because we don't affirm them. But to love is to affirm. And if your message makes someone feel bad, it can't be love. So if a pastor is preaching against sins from the pulpit and it makes you feel bad, that means it's not from God. It's <laughs> So definitely not what we would experience here. All right, so look at God. So God is not only in all things, but creation makes up God. So I'm just going to state his name quickly. We won't spend a lot of time with him. Richard Rohr is a Catholic who has massive importance among all the main lines and the progressive evangelicals. I cannot underestimate his influence. And he is a priest in good standing with the Catholic Church. He says that everything is Christ. You are Christ. The whole world, the whole universe is Christ. And another big thing that progressives would say about God is that God is just one attribute. He's not love and just and holy he is love as they define love right? no wrath at all and richard Rohr also says if it helps you to love then it is the religion of christ whether you're a muslim or a buddhist or anything else it's all about love so if you want to know some big people here um caleb lines richard Rohr. There's a whole bunch of people, I would say, for a lot of evangelicals, they were introduced to prog progressive Christianity through this woman named Jen Hatmaker. So she basically um, says that the fruit of evangelicalism is bad. Her child came out as gay. 
so she changed her views about LGBT theology, and that led her down the path to become progressive. So there's a lot of people here. Um, just to give you one idea, David Hayward, he writes, he makes these memes. He's actually now an atheist, but he still makes these memes that progressive Christians like. Overall, the vast majority are universalists, meaning everyone will eventually end up in heaven. In fact, Richard Rohr says, whether you like it or not, you're already saved. And then 97.48% um, of ELCA in convention <laughs> to basically say that other religions may work to bring people to, to salvation. Only one guy opposed it, and he was then mocked. So you'll note this was different from the other presentations. There I went through what they thought about the sacraments and the end times and their specific doctrines. But the main doctrine for progressive Christianity is that there isn't one. It doesn't matter that a Methodist might have a slightly different view of baptism than an American Baptist. Because to them, that's not what matters. What matters is how they're living out their faith. And they would say that this doctrinal stuff just divides us when we should be united. So how we're gonna unite is to ignore our differences and say that they aren't really important. The ecumenical movement with Catholics and Protestants, that was a big thing that ended up causing the mainline churches to all sort of become similar. That's why the ELCA will share pulpits and communion with the reformed. If you read Lutheran confession, you would know that just doesn't make sense, but they do because it doesn't matter to them. To give you an idea, this obviously is not representative of everyone in a mainline church, but this came out and it was said, including in some ELCA churches. This makes sense to them. When they say that this is Christianity, they mean it. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. They believe it. A non-binary God whose pronouns are plural, Jesus Christ, who wore a fabulous tunic with two dads, and on and on down the line. Okay, so that is the end result of progressivism. It doesn't mean everyone's there yet. So the key takeaway for this, for basically every week that I've taught, is that doctrine does matter. And what really matters is who your authority is. Is your authority your reason and logic? Is your authority tradition? Is your authority your feelings? Depending on what you place authority, you might end up reformed if you tend to value logic above others. If you tend to value tradition, you might end up Roman Catholic. If you value your heart, you might end up evangelical. If you place value in kind of a combination of experts and your heart, you might end up progressing. So here's the issue with all of this. When you lose the comfort and assurance of justification by grace through faith, and when you lose the sacraments, that sacraments are objectively things that God works in you, it's always going to result in you trying to find your assurance in works. Whether that's Catholic, finding your assurance by praying to saints, whether that's reformed, finding your assurance by trying to prove that you're elect by how well you live your life. Whether that's evangelicals, proving your assurance by how you feel at worship. Or progressive, just throwing out the entire idea of hell, trying to prove you're a good person by how hard you work on earth. It all ends up in the same place. So, Overall, scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for all teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped in every good work. So scripture alone is our sole, infallible, inerrant source of authority. Finally, I just kind of want to add here, not every progressive goes that far. Not every Roman Catholic loses faith. Not every Reformed person values their reason so high that they forget the word of God. Think of this, all false, false doctrine is sort of like a poison. 
we can all take different amounts of poison. I have a feeling that I wouldn't survive very much poison, but my grandma had this immense, incredible faith, and she survived and stayed really faithful in the United Methodist Progressive Church. She did that by believing the pastor was just kind of nuts. <laughs> so she just ignored him and read her Bible every day. We can all have different amounts of poison and stay faithful because we are saved by grace through faith. Faith the side of a mustard seed. So, I'm not saying all these people are condemned, but it can be a danger. False doctrine is danger, and we get our assurance from the Bible. So, any question? By the way, here's some resources. There aren't a lot of Lutheran resources, so not a lot of Luth Lutherans have talked about this, but on issues, etc. Recently, Elisa Childers and Tom Kim Barnett. They were just on there yesterday. So, kind of fun stuff. Any questions? All right. Just two minutes late. Close enough. All right. So the next session, the next session of this will end right on time.